All right, well, we're in Genesis uh, chapter 19. If you want to uh, turn there, we're going to look at the first 29 verses. And then, of course, next week, uh, again, after the conference, David Hawking will be with us uh, next uh, next Sunday morning. And then uh, we'll get back to our Genesis study uh, the week after that. But uh, uh, too much to try to take the uh, whole chapter at one time. We'll just look at this one episode of the uh, the judgment of Sodom this uh, this morning. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, uh, we do pray that as we uh, come to uh, a text that teaches about judgment, Lord, we'd, we'd be able to uh, understand that you are a righteous and a holy God, that you have judged in the past, you'll judge in the future. Lord, uh, help us to realize uh, how thankful we should be for your grace that we're going to see in, in this passage as, as well, the saving of Lot from uh, uh, his circumstances, Lord, and as he is totally saved by your grace and your mercy, uh, so are we, Lord. So help us to be able to relate to some of the things in this passage. And Lord, uh, heed the exhortations uh, from your word uh, that our lives might be different when we leave this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, because this chapter deals with a, a homosexual community that's going to get judged by God, there's a, a couple of things that probably need to just get said at the outset. And that is the, the line that we say sometimes, but we need to say again that God uh, loves the sinner but hates the sin. Uh, God uh, loves homosexuals. It's a message they don't hear uh, very often. Uh, I had uh, mentioned in the first service how uh, Strat, my brother-in-law, a number of years ago when he was still uh, here with us on staff, and he had gone down to uh, an event that the... Uh, uh, homosexual community was having in Kapilani Park and uh, uh, with tracks in, uh, in hand and pockets and with a sign uh, that just simply said, uh, God loves homosexuals. And uh, <laughs> stood somewhere in the park where they were all gathered. And, and then anybody that would come by to talk to him, then he'd share with them and give them a track. And he said it was amazing how time and time again, uh, men and women came by and said, Nobody has ever said that to me before, ever. And uh, they just uh, are unaware of it. Uh, God cares about them, but of course, uh, it's a sin like other sexual sins and all sins that he will judge in the end. That's certainly part of what we're seeing in, in the text this morning. Uh, the problem in, in our own culture is it's now politically incorrect to even say that we think something is wrong like this or certain Hot, uh, hot button subjects, and, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, it's going to take on new dimensions, uh, potentially here in our own state, as uh, when uh, Governor Abercrombie uh, was elected to office and was sworn in very shortly after that, of course, the civil unions bill was, was passed here uh, in our state, uh, which would allow a type of license that will kick into gear in 2012 for same-sex couples. What will happen shortly after that, according to all the uh, legal things that I've read about it, is that it will shortly be taken back into court. Uh, and uh, because of the cases already heard, because of the way the legislation's already uh, written, that civil unions bill will shortly become then uh, a same-sex marriage uh, law that will be on, on the books. In the states where that's already taken place, uh, a number of the issues uh, come into conflict with Christians, Christian business owners, uh, churches, uh, and ministries. Uh, in several states now, uh, groups like Catholic Charities, uh, evangelical uh, groups that do uh, social services have been completely shut down, even though they were the largest provider in the state of social services, in this case to uh, adoptive families and foster kids uh, being placed in homes because, of course, they as Christians would refuse to place those children in the homes of same-sex couples, even though they are legally married in the state. So the state then pulls their license, uh, they're out of business. You've got other uh, uh, churches that had uh, retreat centers uh, in their own church facilities that they would uh, allow the community to use, uh, to, uh, other people to hold weddings and so forth, but of course then would refuse same-sex couples to use them for uh, for weddings and so forth. So then they were sued and given the choice of either not allowing anyone to use it uh, or they had to allow the same-sex couples. So they had to no longer allow groups or people in the community to use their facilities. And it goes on and on. The wedding photographer, the florist, uh, and you, uh, you name it, the implication. That's, that's the point of same-sex marriage. 
<laughs> there's very few homosexuals that are really interested in, in, in marriage. That doesn't really fit with the lifestyle. Uh, it's to gain legal standing to gain special rights, special uh, privileges, and so forth. It comes uh, directly uh, against uh, our religious beliefs, evangelical Christians in particular. And because of that, then, uh, in the things that we read about the news, and I could go on, on and on and really distress you about some of the things that are going on in the country, it would cause us then to not pray for those people that need the Lord so desperately. Uh, you know, it's really, a, again, as we've said before, kind of, I think, a strategy of, uh, of Satan to, to keep us from doing what we ought to be doing and, uh, and me praying for. Because the other thing that needs to be stated, not only does God love them, but there's nothing gay about being gay. You know, I've known enough guys uh, that were homosexuals, ones that came out of lifestyle, ones that didn't, uh, and, uh, and their lives were not gay. Uh, if you read the statistics, which you're not allowed to talk about in public these days, is that they have a much higher rate of, of having violence in their life, of depression, of mental Ill illness. Their uh, 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 sexually transmitted diseases are off the charts and so forth. Uh, they just, they have a, a, a life of problems, and uh, it's not gay. Uh, they are, they're uh, hurting people. They got into that situation be, usually because something went wrong uh, along the line with them that they ended up, you know, being bent in, uh, in that way. So they're, they're, they're hurting people out there. They don't uh, often hear the message that God loves them, that Jesus died for their sins, uh, and so forth, uh, nor to have others praying for them. But, uh, uh, certainly, we need to uh, to do that, and and of course, we can't almost talk about the subject w without even th uh, talking about uh, 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 Jonathan, you know, Cuneo, who was part of our church for a number of years, probably 20 years, who came out of the uh, homosexual lifestyle and shared his testimony openly, was uh, on television, interviewed uh, uh, many many times over the years, uh, and was uh, again living for the Lord and completely celibate for. Uh, uh, 13 plus uh, plus years, uh, and even then you have to realize what they were going through. Every year, John would go down and get his test to see if he was HIV positive or not, because you can carry it in your system for 10 years without any symptoms, which is part of the problem. He he rejoiced and called me on that 10th year when he was like, no HIV, don't have it, not going to have it. Uh, praise praise the Lord over it. Uh, these are the messages uh, that uh, are not heard in, in the media uh, of the redeeming work of, of Jesus Christ. Well, that needed to be said also in terms of what's happening here as we see the culmination of the spiritual decline of Lot, who was, of course, traveling with Abraham, was Abraham's uh, nephew. And, uh, and what happens is he makes some very bad decisions. And we talked about, uh, in looking at their lives before, some questions to ask before making decisions that we might know the Lord's will. But uh, what a contrast here. Abraham is, is known as a, a friend of, of God. Lot is known as the friend of the world. Uh, when the angels came to visit Abraham, he was at the tent door waiting. Uh, Lot was uh, at the gate of a wicked city. Abram was a pilgrim and a stranger only passing through. Lot had gradually abandoned his tent and settled down in, uh, in Sodom. And when the strangers come uh, to them, who turn out to be angels, to Abraham it was, and with the Lord. Uh, to Lot, it was the two strangers that turned out to be angels without the Lord. One of them had a relationship, uh, one of them didn't. And we'll see, continue to see contrast between these, these two men. When the angels and the Lord show up to Abraham, they're telling him, hey, you're going to have a son this time next year. Well, when these same messengers show up to Lot, they're saying, your city's going to be destroyed in the morning. A little contrast between uh, somebody that is uh, uh, doing his best, and we've seen, and we're going to see it again. Abraham's not perfect, man. He sure blows it his time. But he repents, and he's doing his best to walk with the Lord by faith uh, compared to Lot, who just progressively uh, walked away fr from the Lord. Uh, probably, uh, again, a, a key thing that we saw last week in the end of verse 25, chapter 18, the question of Abraham to the Lord, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And so we left there at the end, seeing that it was essential, God believed, that Abraham understood that he was, and that he is about ready to judge Sodom and why. 
uh, and that it was his responsibility to know that and then to understand it and to teach it to his own children. Well, let's look at our text, verse 1 to 3. We've got these two angels arriving in the city. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom when Lot saw them. He rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked matzah, unleavened bread, and they ate. Well, again, the angels arrive, uh, lots there in the gateway of the city. And uh, uh, we might ask our question, uh, the question, is it wrong for him to be there? Well, again, the location wasn't the problem. The problem was the heart of Lot, why he was doing what he was doing. God placed Joseph in Egypt, a very evil place as well. But he had a purpose and a reason for him. And Joseph becomes a wonderful example to us of a young teenage guy and how he's able to walk with the Lord faithful despite his circumstances around them and eventually have an influence over those around him. Daniel is another young teenage guy in Babylon, the center and, uh, and again, the birthplace of idolatry, but he's able to walk with the Lord, be committed to the Lord, and again, have an influence over those around him. Esther in Persia, we could uh, go on and on. The issue is not the place, it's the heart of the person. It's been said that Lot's heart was in Sodom long before his body arrived. Uh, and no doubt he is, uh, his first love was the world, and he got a taste of it when he went with Uncle Abraham down to Egypt. We saw that earlier, and he never overcame it. We've also mentioned the fact that uh, there seems to be no tent, no altar to the Lord, no worship, no communion, no fellowship. And there's no wonder that the Lord is not part of this party that heads to condemn the city. Uh, Lot's position at the gate, though, indicates he's a major player. Uh, and we've mentioned this before, and most of you know now that if you sat in the gate of the city, it meant you were uh, an elder, uh, a city councilman, we might say in our uh, contemporary term, uh, terminology. It's a place they did business uh, and so forth. So Lot ends up, uh, he's well known in the city. And he's a, he's a man of prominence uh, in this particular uh, city. Uh, notice his uh, assimilation into Sodom. Verse uh, 12 of chapter 13, it says, He moved his tent as far as Sodom. Then in chapter 14, we see that he's now dwelling in Sodom, and we get here and uh, we find him in chapter 19, sitting in the gate of Sodom. So he is prominent, he is well known in the gates of the city. And notice the issue of hospitality comes up here. He does bow to them as Abraham did. He does invite them uh, into his uh, home as uh, Abraham did. Uh, and, uh, and what's interesting here is that the angels turn him down, which uh, culturally, uh, uh, you're not supposed to do that. I mean, if you show up, somebody's supposed to offer you hospitality, you, you say thank you and you receive the hospitality. You don't, you don't get to say no, <laughs> in other words. So this is a shock. This is a shock to Lot. They're like, no, we'll just stay here in the open square. And he's like, Okay, but I think you'll be dead by morning. You know, I mean, he's, you know, he knows what's going to happen to them. He knows the kind of uh, city that he's in. Uh, notice in, uh, uh, in verse 3 it says, But he insisted strongly when he, when he says, You've got to come with me. One writer said that he manhandled them uh, to get them off of the streets uh, before it became dark and uh, into the city. Again, all speaking of the, the condition of the city, why there was an outcry unto the Lord. Well, the angels arrive, and now we're going to see that in verses, verses 4 to 11, it's all the men of the city that surround the house. Verse 4, now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you. You may do to them as you wish. Only do not harm these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. 
Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with him and shut the door. And they seized the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, excuse me, struck them with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Several things that are, need to be mentioned here. One is the fact that, uh, notice it's all the men of the city, verse 4. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people of every quarter. How many men of the city were there? All, all of them. Which uh, leads uh, to two uh, basic uh, assumptions that we can make. They were either all homosexual and or bisexual. Now his daughters are engaged to men, so there are marriages there. Therefore, they're, they're all in the city. Every man is either bisexual or homosexual. Two things just to, to mention about this is that bisexual, <laughs> that's a term you don't even hear anymore. Why don't you hear that term anymore? Well, it kind of blows this idea that you're born that way. See, if, if they don't, the term used to be sexual preference. You don't hear that term anymore either. Now it's sexual orientation. I don't have a choice. This is just who I am, right? That's the vernacular that we hear from uh, gay activists today. And they, uh, they try to link it to uh, supposed studies that have come out and shown a genetic link between homosexuality and, uh, and their own uh, uh, genetic structure and so forth. And there's been several news stories over the, over the years. I, I Googled and, uh, and read a few yesterday. Uh, and it's always, uh, we believe that we have found. Exciting news that we have found. There's people looking for this all the time to substantiate the concept that is put out in the media all the time on behalf of the homosexual community. The problem is when further research is done, it turns out it's not valid. You know, when a more detailed study was done, we found out that that information was contradictory to what we saw later. That part doesn't always make it into the media. You know, the, the rebuttal story that comes out later, that doesn't really come across as the headline story, as, uh, as the first story. Uh, and um, uh, your kids, uh, if they're uh, certainly in, uh, in a, in a non-Christian setting being educated, they are taught every day all the way through their educational system that it's a sexual orientation, that it is not a choice, that people are just born that way and you need to accept it. That's kind of the, uh, the mantra of the day. Therefore, you don't hear the term bisexual anymore because it basically is counter or contradicts this idea of sexual orientation. But in Sodom, that's the way it is. All the men there were there that night surrounding the house. And, uh, and we see, therefore, it's the dominant lifestyle in, in Sodom. Now, we can tell from Leviticus 18, uh, from chapter 20 as well, that homosexuality had become one of the common perversions of the Canaanites. Uh, but uh, uh, again, here, something very different, this idea of the, of the violence uh, along with it was, was not known uh, in these other uh, societies. Moses' words uh, can be translated this way. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. All of them were there. And uh, the sexual orientation aside, again, tremendous violence uh, in this particular city and culture. Uh, which, again, goes along with this idea that we saw last week with, and the cry went out to the Lord, talking about oppression of people within this particular city. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned several times in the Old Testament to the idea of judgment and different things, but it's mentioned twice in the New Testament. One of them is in 2 Peter 2, 6-9. We made reference to it, I think, last week. But let me read it again. Peter writing here, saying, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from the day to day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for, for the day of judgment. 
Notice that Peter is called righteous three times. And if there wasn't this verse in the Bible, we would assume he wasn't. <laughs> Other than that, he's the only guy that gets out of town pretty much. But he's being, he's being, uh, he's being drug out. Uh, notice it describes him as distressed, uh, which literally means worn down by what he's seen, by the continual torment, it says, of his, uh, uh, of his soul, his, quote, <coughs> righteous soul. And, and again, we wonder how. Well, again, righteous doesn't mean perfect. It just means he had placed his faith in, uh, in God and believes in God in the same way that uh, in uh, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham's faith was accredited to him to righteous, righteousness. The writer of Hebrews tells us of Noah, another righteous man of that era, who certainly was not sinless. By this, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. It's simply... Simply, Lot's faith placed at some point in time in God, it makes him righteous uh, in that, uh, that same sin. And we'll see as we go through this, <laughs> he was saved by grace <laughs> and by grace alone. We could even refer to these angels, even though they're bringing judgment as grace angels as they come in and, uh, and take him out of, uh, out of this uh, uh, city before the judgment falls. But here's a guy with a conflicted soul. He's offended and he's allured at the same time. He's not barred in the city. He's hunkered down, settled in, a prominent man in the city, conflicted but not doing anything about it. And again, if he could have just won his own family to the Lord and a couple of other people, all of these people would have been spared the judgment. Would God spare the city if there were just 10 righteous? God says, yes, I would. There's only one, uh, and it wouldn't be spared. Therefore, Lot becomes this paradigm, this prototype of, well, the carnal believer. The person that's coming to a relationship with the Lord that's not really walking with the Lord. Uh, the person that is so given over to the things of the world that there's no communion, there's no worship, there's not much happening. And uh, we'll see at the end, man, it's, it's the prayers and the intercession of Abraham that really save, uh, save Lot. Pray for your friends. They used to walk with the Lord, you know. Peter says, doesn't the Lord know how to deliver the godly? He does. And uh, man, some radical circumstances, but Lot's going to get delivered. But uh, what a way to, uh, to live his life. Uh, and the second thing about this is the visitors are there. Uh, the uh, protection he offers them, which kind of blows us away, of course. He's out there. They're demanding that he bring these guys out. Uh, and he says, well... I'm not going to do that. Uh, he'd be obligated taking them under his roof to defend them uh, with his life. But at the same time, he says, I'll send my two virgin daughters out and, uh, and you can have them. Uh, there's two things here. One, it speaks of the depravity of Lot, certainly. Uh, and the other thing, uh, it speaks of, uh, of just, well, one writer said that because his daughters were virgin, because they were pledged in marriage, According to the custom of the day, anyone that touched them would be executed, the death penalty. Maybe he's saying this knowing that there really can be nothing done or happened to them. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, it's just kind of a figure of speech, almost kind of a thing. Uh, either way, it kind of shakes us up but to think that uh, a father would say something like this of his own daughters. But again, we're not used to this concept of taking someone in our home and because we have, now we have to defend them uh, with our own lives. But that is still what goes on in the Middle East today. And uh, I want to show you a picture of some guys, and one of them is alive because of it. The guy in the middle is uh, Marcus Luttrell, and uh, he's alive today because this custom is still, still in play. This is half of a Navy SEAL team that uh, took place in what was called uh, Operation Red Wing. I don't know if you... Remember reading about it, read about it, or, or whatever. These guys were based out of Pearl Harbor at, at the time. It's quite a, quite a story. But they were uh, half, the, half of their SEAL team, these five guys, and they were basically hunkered down uh, and they're you know, all camoed in and waiting for, uh, up in the mountains, waiting outside a village for a high-value target to, uh, to appear. And then they, uh, they were uh, going to take him out. Uh, they were, uh, again, in embedded in there, and a shepherd jumped over a log and landed on one of the guys that was uh, all, all buried in. He pops up, and, uh, and then there's two shepherds, and they've got to decide what to do with these two guys. 
because uh, it's either let them go or kill them. And uh, after a lot of a lot of discussion, uh, they decide that um, they need to let them go and do a little questioning with them. They let them go, and within a, a half an hour or or so, they got a hundred Taliban after them, and they got the high ground. <clears throat> These guys are even in that position. Uh, he says of his own account, Marcus, that if we could have got to the high ground, we could have taken all hundred of them on. <laughs> The confidence, but but we could never get there, and they fought us downhill, and they they were falling down cliffs. Uh, again, in his own account, he talks about falling down cliffs 20, 30 feet, hitting on another ledge, catching himself, and he would turn. And every time it happened three or four times, his rifle would fall, and then right next to it, up, he was able to pick it up and keep uh, fighting, keeping uh, keep defending himself. They took out like 50 or 60 of them. Uh, but eventually, every one of them was wounded. Uh, the guy on the right is uh, Lieutenant Michael Murphy. Uh, he ends up uh, knowing uh, he's already wounded, but the radio is in the, uh, the open ground. Uh, he goes out to it, uh, goes on the radio, calls in their position, what's going on, while he's taking rounds uh, until, uh, until, he, uh, until he dies, later receives the, uh, the Medal of Honor for that. Eventually, Marcus just falls further or somehow in his falling uh, then, though wounded, crawls uh, about uh, 11 miles uh, through the jungle, takes out six more Taliban. The other, the other guys uh, make it. He ends up passing out on a trail outside of another uh, Pushan village, uh, the, the village of Sabri Mina. Uh, at that point, the elders of that village find him, and they have a very lengthy discussion about what to do with him because of, well, our situation here in chapter 19. If they take him into their village, then it means that every man in that village will fight to the death to defend the person they've taken in and shown hospitality to. And that's what they decide to do. Uh, they refer to it as loka warkawa. And once they take him in, every guy's sworn to the death. They take him in, they place him, uh, give him medical attention, place him in the, uh, the, the uh, chief or elder's uh, home, uh, every guy is armed and set a perimeter and they're waiting for the Taliban to show up, which they do. And of course, they're, they're, they're on friendly terms with them and the Taliban need these guys, you know, to be able to survive up in the mountains and so forth. So there's kind of a standoff and they back away, not wanting to uh, uh, have a firefight with these guys right on the spot. Uh, Marcus is there for several days. I, th I believe it's, I remember it being the uh, the chief's son then gets out of the village at night and he um, hikes 20 miles uh, to get to the closest uh, military installation where he's able to make them aware of Marcus, uh, gives an exact positioning. They send in special ops guys and they, and they get him out. He is the lone survivor of his, uh, of his SEAL team. Uh, it's a great, great story. Uh, he received the, uh, the Navy Cross and uh, the others were decorated as, uh, as well. But the concept still exists today. That's, that's my point. You know, when Lot jumps out and says, hey, I'll give you my two daughters, we're like, what, what kind of a lunatic are you? But he was obligated culturally to give his own life, fight to the death, because he had taken someone, uh, someone in. It's a very conflicted and a very compromised guy, Lot. Uh, and again, extending this hospitality, uh, placing his family uh, in arm's way, uh, it's hard for us to comprehend and understand. But notice their reaction to even what he says in verse 9. And they said, stand back. This one uh, who came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Uh, things haven't changed. People in uh, the homosexual community do not like you unless you'll give them favored status. Uh, they don't want to just exist. They want approval. That's, that's why the, the, the legal fights, uh, the favored status. That's why the establishment of this idea that there's a genetic link, it's not my choice. Therefore, I meet the criteria of being a minority, and therefore, I need legal protection like other minorities. And if you say anything against me, then... Well, you're not going to hear the end of it from, from us. And uh, it's the, the culture that we live in today, again, is very similar. I would say it's not the same, but certainly uh, it's, it's certainly moving in, in that direction. The third thing about the men of the city, they are temporarily blinded then by the angels. And, uh, and again, 
reminds us of the second Peter 2 9 that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from from trials apparently it uh, based on the Hebrew suggests that it was a blinding flash of light that left them temporarily dazed but notice also once blinded they're not like well I'm out of here I'm I'm blinded I've had enough of this they're still trying to get in the door I mean again it speaks to the violence and the perversiveness of the the, the men in this particular city so it's, uh, it's uh, amazing uh, so the angels arrive it's uh, really a uh, uh, situation is with all the men of the city and now the angels are able to announce the judgment to Lot look at that in verse 12 to 22 then the men said to Lot have you anyone else son-in-law your sons your daughters and whomever you have in the city take them out of this place for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. While he lingered, <laughs> while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, uh, that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, please know, my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and uh, it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have, found, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there. For I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little. So, uh, again, the angels announce this uh, judgment coming to the city. And uh, the contrast uh, continue with Lot, who finds out his city is being judged, versus Abraham that finds that he's going to have a, a son the next uh, year. Lot goes out. He's supposed to uh, speak to all of his family members that are there. Goes out to his uh, sons-in-law and... Uh, and tries to speak with them, and they think he's only, he's only joking. And uh, again, which uh, you know, goes to the case of uh, why is there not more credibility with Lot, uh, with these guys? Why is it that they don't believe him? Why is it they think he's only joking? He said he never spoke to them about the Lord before. Has he ever not mentioned the idea of God's judgment before? He's never mentioned the idea of placing your faith in God before and how critical it is. This is the first time in a critical time, and now they think he's only joking. Secondly, the angels announce the instructions that have to be followed. Flee, don't look back, don't stop in the plane, and flee to the mountains. Now, the first time Lot is rescued by God via Abraham, he's a prisoner of war. But, of course, he doesn't get that wake-up call, and he goes right back to Sodom once again. Uh, again, God has to take him, notice it's by the hand, and forcibly drag him out. Uh, first, he, he lingered, then he argued, and then he begged to go his own way. <laughs> it's just, again, it's like, oh, um, yeah, I know that's what you're telling me, uh, you know, to go to the mountains. But, you know, if I found favor in your eyes and I found mercy and he throws out all this fly, uh, flowering stuff, he says, uh, how about if I go to that little Sodom over there? See, it was just another city in the plain, like the other plains. Can I just go to that little city over there? You know, I'm worried about some evil may overtake me. You're with two angels. I think you're okay. You know, I don't think there's going to be any real evil that overtake you. The only you got to worry about is God's judgment here. But it's just, it's just, it's almost hard to grasp. But have you ever tried sharing with somebody that's walked away from the Lord? I mean, they're like this. It's like, come on. God has shown you mercy this long. You need to turn back to the Lord. Your life is, is wasting away. How can you do this? How can you be like this? It, 
It's just, it's a blindness. That's what Paul talks about in, in, in Romans 1. There's the, a hardness of heart that comes, and there's a blindness that is imparted as a well. It's just, it's just hard to believe. But here, Lot, he's got to be forcibly drug out of the city. That's why we would say he is absolutely saved by, by grace, uh, by divine grace, never due to his own merit, completely undeserved. As we'll see in uh, verse 29, based on Abraham's prayers. One writer, Kidner, says that uh, of, uh, of Lot here, not even brimstone will make a pilgrim of him. <laughs> he must have his little Sodom again if his life is to be supportable. Uh, un unbelievable. God help us. So the angels arrive. It's all the men in the city involved here. The judgment's announced. 23 to 29, the cities are completely annihilated. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him as she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold... The smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Notice they are annihilated by burning sulfur. It was God directed. The Lord, it says, then the Lord rained brimstone in fire. Verse 25, so he overthrew the cities. The judgment had its origin in God. It was decided by God. It was executed by God. And uh, we also note that in the midst of it, Mrs. Lot didn't, didn't make it. Now, you know, I, can, I guess I have the Hollywood uh, version in my mind, even when I read the text, that they're, uh, they're getting out of the city. And one angel's got, got Mr. and Mrs. by the hands, dragging them. And the other one's got the two daughters by the hands and dragging them out of the city. And uh, in the Hollywood version, she just barely glances back over her shoulder, you know, becomes a pillar of salt, right? Uh, I don't really think that's what's happening because uh, remember, she stops and she turns and they keep going. And the angel said, we can't do anything until we get you into that city and you're delivered. So there's, there's a time gap here that's, that's gone on uh, before she actually is overcome. She's overcome in the judgment of the cities uh, it takes them a while to, to get there. Did it take them 15 or 20 minutes or an hour or two hours or three hours or four hours? Well, uh, we don't really know. It took them a while, though. So her being turned into a pillar of salt in this sense uh, was because she just continued and continued and continued despite the pleadings to say no. That stuff back there is more important to me, and I'm having a hard time leaving it. Remember, her family's going the other way. It's not like, well, I can't leave my family. Well, your family's that way. It's just stuff. For her possession's sake, uh, she turns back. And Jesus makes reference to this in John 17 uh, in verse 31. I want to read you that, that passage. That's the other place where uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned in the New Testament. There it says, in that day, Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to, uh, again, this could be... Uh, you know, cross-reference to uh, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, last days, middle of the tribulation, when the Antichrist sits himself up in the temple to be worshipped uh, by God, as Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, when he does that, Jesus says, when you see this stuff happening, the city surrounded, you know, you flee and get to the wilderness. Uh, that's the context here. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. What, do you think Lot's wife really was turned into a pillar of salt? According to Jesus, uh, she was. Very interesting because we kind of smile at this, but uh, Flavius Josephus, when he's writing, the Jewish historian, says that he saw the pillar of salt that was Lot's wife. It was there for a number of years, apparently, as a testimony to what happened there on this particular uh, judgment day. One writer said of her, she was a wife after Lot's own heart. 
And that was, that was the only problem. But she was without grace. <laughs> the, that's the only difference between these, these two people. Uh, he had God's grace because he had placed his faith in the Lord. Uh, she had never done that. She remains fixated on a bunch of stuff left back in the, uh, in the city. Uh, again, amazing as uh, she tarries for a period of time. Eventually, when uh, this all comes down, she's probably unconscious by the, uh, the, uh, the gases that would uh, overtake her. Her corpse would lay there, eventually become encrusted in salt and, and debris uh, and be a testimony for a number of years to the destruction that took place. But uh, again, there's others that, that look back and hang on to a reputation, a relationship, a particular tr uh, lust, a comfort, whatever it might be. And Jesus says, to, saying to believers, remember Lot's wife. Uh, here is here's someone that the angel of grace came and grabbed and tried to pull out of God's judgment, but, uh, but refused. Very sobering passage. Now, the passage continues with kind of a familiar teaching of Jesus. And it's, uh, it's referenced, it's given in three different Gospels. Verse 33 continues, Jesus goes on and says, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. We can either walk with the Lord or not walk with the Lord. We can live for ourselves, do our own thing, seek to preserve our life, our self, and so forth. Uh, but... Uh, We'll lose it in the end. Now, I like Mark's account. It's just, uh, it's just a little more fuller in what Jesus is teaching here. and helps you really paint the picture. Mark 8, 35, he says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for, notice, my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. And Jesus says, remember Lot's wife and what, uh, what happened to her. Very, very sobering as we really plead and, and pray for <coughs> those that we know that, uh, that are, are not walking with the Lord. And we'll also see, though, Lot gets saved. Were there 10 righteous? No, there was only one. The only reason Lot gets saved out of this is because of the intercession of Abraham. That's what's implied in verse 29. And, uh, and that's what we see here, that Abraham views the, uh, the cities now annihilated uh, from that uh, place on the uh, hillside there. And we have to wonder if uh, his question the day before it came to his mind, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? In verse 29, uh, Abraham realizes that he did. As it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham. What well, did he remember? That he was praying, that he was interceding, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Only one single soul was actually righteous. Lot, what a, what a picture. Just to use your sanctified imagination, have a little bit of fun to try to make a point here. I can imagine Lot at his 50th high school reunion. Guys are coming up to him. Lot, man, it's good to see you. Hey, now how do things work out for you? Because, you know, you're hooked up with Abraham. And, man, he's like the real deal. I mean, that guy's really done well. I can't even believe how many herds and everything that guy's got and all the people that work for him. And are you still with him? You know, because, you, know, you know, I've just had a little dealings with him. That's like the, what a spiritual guy. That's like the most gracious guy I've ever met in my life. I mean, just, just to be around him. I mean, and what a blessing it must be. You're his nephew, and you're still working for him, right? Well, no, actually, we kind of had a parting of the ways. Oh, really? Well, how did, how did that work out? Well, it's a, kind of a long story. Well, where are you living now? A little cave over here by Zoar. Wow didn't really work out too well, did it? I mean, you think about what he could have had and, and what, he, what he ended up having. It's, uh, it's kind of sobering. Paul says in Romans 12, to not be conformed to the world. We'd say the lot was conformed to the world. The prophet Malachi declares this in, Matthew, uh, in Malachi 4.1, talking about a similar idea of the coming day of judgment, but what the Lord can 
bring to us. He says, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do, who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. They will leave them neither root nor branch, but, contrast, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, the Messiah, shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. I think that's a good thing. Uh, don't know if you're into calves, but uh, hey, what a contrast. Here's the coming judgment of God, but here's the blessing for those of you that know the Lord, that, uh, that fear his name. Uh, is this the reality we're living in right now? Absolutely. This is, this is the reality that we're living in. I don't know if, if judgment means anything to unbelievers, but I think believers need to hear it frequently because we'll be reminded of what we've been saved from and what's at stake as we, like Abraham, intercede, plead, but Lord, shall the judge of the earth do right? I'm interceding for my friend over here, my nephew, whoever it might be. Can't you send one of those angels of grace to come in and grab him by the wrist and kind of yank him out as well? That's a good prayer for us. So not the judge of the earth do right. And again, to go back to this idea of those that are in the homosexual community, I, you know, they don't like to hear that what they're doing is sin. And there's actually uh, evangelical homosexual churches that are very orthodox in their belief. A lot of them are even pre-mid, pre pre-trip. Pre uh, they believe in the virgin birth. They believe in the, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's coming again to judge the world. That they're, they're, their beliefs, are, some of them are very orthodox, except for one issue. They deny that the Bible teaches that homosexuality is a sin. That deception will mean everything in the end in terms of judgment day. I think... The fact that it's a sin, like all sexual sin is sin, is good news because Jesus died for sins. And when we confess and renounce them, Proverbs 28, uh, 13 tells us, we'll find mercy. You know, and uh, that's the place we need to pray for them. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul writing to a church, uh, the believers there, says this, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. So he's just kind of mentioning the folks in the church right there. This is what you guys were like before, right? But what happened? Uh, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Uh, this is the New Testament church here. People coming out of these lifestyles and having the power of God come in their lives and forgive their sin and radically change their life. That's a message that we actually have to convey individually we, it's, it get, it's getting very difficult to even say it uh, in public. Uh, the websites and the ministries, like Focus on the Family uh, and others, when they say this on their, lev uh, their websites, uh, they have all kinds of problems as a, re as a result of them. Uh, they have, uh, it's just amazing the things that are going on. People don't like to hear this message, but it's the message that will save them. There's a real spiritual warfare going on, isn't there? Our, our days are not quite like Sodom and Gomorrah, but we're certainly moving in that direction. We need to make sure that, yeah, we need to stand up for traditional marriage, stand up for our beliefs and our values in the public square and let our voice be heard. At the same time, when we're attacked by the other side, <laughs> we don't want to attack back. We want to pray. <laughs> These are hurting lost people. And uh, we need to pray for God's mercy to be upon them. And given the opportunity, just be nice. Just be friendly and try to show them the love of God. They, there are per, people that are, that are hurting uh, for it, and, uh, and their lives can be radically different if they come to know the grace of God. Well, let's pray. Lord.